and chapter six is an introduction to viruses. Okay? We briefly talked about viruses before. These are those small little particles, okay, they're not really cells, uh, that can cause disease. Okay? And they do this by entering living cells, taking those cells over, and using them as what we call viral factories. Okay? When this happens to cells in your body, you get an immune response, and then you feel ill. Okay? So we're just going to introduce the concept of what a virus is, where did they come from, how are they made up, and how do they actually uh, um, cause disease. So, we focus today on the virus side of things, and in this there are two groups, uh, animal viruses, or which we often just call viruses, and then bacteriophages. Okay? Animal viruses, which you see an example of right here, this is the HIV virus, um, are viruses that infect animals, okay, like ourselves. These viruses are um, interesting because they can actually fully enter a cell. They literally just push themselves through the cell and that's how they infect it, okay? Bacteriophages are viruses that infect bacterial cells, okay? And this is an example of a bacteriophage down here. And bacteriophages are different because they cannot actually enter a bacterial cell. And the reason for that is this bacteria have that thick, hard cell wall. So instead of fully entering, they just inject material into the cell. Okay? So those are the two big differences. Animals versus bacteria. And this guy fully enters, and this guy just injects DNA. So uh, viruses of themselves are a relatively new phenomenon. Okay? The study of viruses, or what we call virology, really didn't come about until the 1950s. And the reason for that is that these guys are really, really, really so we cannot see them with a light microscope. So the way that we discovered them initially was using something called an electron microscope, which wasn't developed until the 40s or so. Okay? Um, also, viruses require living cells to grow in. Okay? So you can't just take a virus, put it on a petri dish, and grow colonies like you can in bacteria. Instead, you need to have cells that the virus uh, can live in, growing in a dish, that you then add the virus to, and then it grows and populates from those cells, okay? So both of those reasons are why it took so long before we could really study and understand viruses. But the term virus was actually described by Louis Pasteur uh, in 1890, and uh, um, at that point we couldn't see it, we couldn't grow it, but we knew that people were getting sick from things that we couldn't culture. So let's say someone gets a flu, and if you're Louis Pasteur, you try to get the flu from that person and grow it on a dish. He couldn't. And again, that's because viruses need cells to replicate it. So he termed, uh, or, or coined a term virus, which basically was something that was not culturable, but could still transmit disease. Okay? And that's exactly what a virus is. So he did that one. Some interesting tidbits about viruses. There's a virus out there that can infect every type of cell out there, okay? So what that means is there's literally millions upon millions upon millions of different viruses around, okay? Most of which we have absolutely no idea about, okay? And in fact, there are some viruses that can infect multiple different types of cells, okay? So it's not just one cell that they always go after. Sometimes they can infect many types of cells. They cannot exist independently from their host cell, because they cannot replicate without a cell to take over. Okay? So they aren't technically considered alive in their own right. Okay? They're kind of this, in this gray area. They're not alive on their own because they need a living thing to live off of. Okay? But they're not just some lifeless particle because they can still change life. They can change the way that cells function and they can cause disease and death in animals. <clears throat> We often call them infectious particles, also known as virions. Okay? So these are small little particles which are infectious. They are obligate intracellular parasites. Obligate means it's required. Intracellular means it's inside of a cell. And parasite means to live off of something that is alive. Okay? So they are a small uh, infectious particle that needs to live inside of a cell, a living cell. This is the same thing, but in a nice little cartoon diagram. And here are some examples of what viruses actually look like using an electron microscope. And so you can see they do very greatly in their shapes and their sizes, okay? just like we talked about with other microbes. 
Some of them can be very small, 20 nanometers in diameter, while others can be very large, 450 nanometers in diameter. So again, it just depends on the virus and the species of the virus, um, and that determines its size and its length. For viewing viruses, as I mentioned, we need to use an electron microscope. And you can't just take virus and show, put it on an electron microscope and see it. You actually have to stain it, just like we would for bacteria. Um, however, instead of using dyes, we often use gold or heavy metal particles. Okay? This covers the virus, and then we can easily pick it up using electron microscope. This is just to give you an idea of the size variation between viruses and how they compare to bacteria. So up at the top, we have Streptococcus, and we have E. coli, which are two common bacteria. Um, which you guys will see throughout the semester. Over here, we have one of the largest viruses that we know of. This is Mimi virus. And you can see it's about, you know, a third of the size of a typical streptococcal organism. So this guy, you might be able to see with a light microscope, but it would look just like a little tiny speck. It wouldn't be very easy to distinguish from anything else. Below that, we have herpes virus, or herpes simplex virus, called this cold sores. Below that, we have rabies, called this rabies. Then we have HIV, influenza, adenoviruses, which are responsible for a lot of colds, a bacteriophage, which infects bacteria, polio, which used to cause paralysis, and then lastly, yellow fever, which is a mosquito-borne illness, okay, not in uh, uh, equatorial regions of the world. You can see they vary greatly in size, depending on the type of virus that you're dealing with. Now, when we look at the composition of the virus, or what is it made up of, it is relatively simple. Okay? There's really not much there. You have three major components, a capsid, an envelope, and a genetic core. Okay? The capsid is a protein coat that covers the virus, and it acts as a protectant, so it protects the virus from the environment. The envelope is an additional layer that surrounds the capsid, and this is again used for protection. And the core is the genetic material, either DNA or RNA. And this is the bit of, or the part of the virus that actually does the dirty work. This is the part that once it gets into the cell, it takes the cell over and uses that cell to make viral bits and pieces. Okay. Now it's important to know that the core can be made out of DNA or RNA, but never both. Okay. It's going to be one or two. So as you can see, they're relatively simple. There's only really three components to them, unlike the eukaryotes where there's you know, 15. However, they're still relatively complex to study and understand. And the reason for that is, is yes, they're simple in their composition, but the way that they get into the cell and take that cell over is very, very complex. And it changes from one virus to the next. So just because we understand HIV doesn't mean we understand uh, you know, hepatitis B. They're two totally different viruses, and they're going to go about it in totally different ways. And because it's on such a small scale, it becomes really, really, really difficult to understand as scientists. So again, you have the external coatings, which are the capsid and the envelope, and then the internal bit, which we call the core, which is made of nucleic acid. Nucleic acid is just a generic term for DNA or RNA. Okay? Both DNA and RNA are nucleic Now, one part of this, so the envelope, does not necessarily need to be there. Okay? The envelope is you know, kind of a, an additional bit that a lot of animal viruses have because it gives them a little bit more protection, but it is not an absolute requirement. Okay? So if a virus has an envelope, we call that an enveloped virus. If it lacks an envelope, we call that a naked virus. Most animal viruses, more importantly, most human pathogenic viruses, are going to be enveloped, which means they have an envelope around them. When you have the nucleic acid and the capsid together, this is known as the nucleocapsid, and an individual virus is often called a virion or an infectious particle. So here is an example of two viruses. On the left, we have a naked virus, and on the right, we have an enveloped virus. The naked virus lacks an envelope, so all you see here is the shell, which is called the capsid, and then the nucleic acid, or which we often call the core. Okay? In the envelope virus, you see the same thing, nucleic acid, the core, or excuse me, the capsid, 
But then you also see this an additional layer known as the envelope. Okay? The envelope is a portion of the cell that the virus takes with it as it leaves. Okay? It's usually made up of cell membranes. So it literally just pushes itself out, covers itself with cell membranes, and what this does is create a third layer uh, surrounding the virus. So let's talk a little bit more about the capsid. Okay? The capsid is a protein shell. Or protein coat. It is hard, it is rigid, and it is designed to protect the virus. Okay? When the virus is outside of the cell, it's very vulnerable to things like the immune system, as well as to things like you know, chemicals and other stuff. Okay? So the capsid is designed to cover the core, okay, or the, the center of the virus, and protect it from all of these bad things in the environment. Okay? It is made up of proteins, and these individual proteins are called capsomeres. So you have capsomeres, and when those come together, you form a capsid. Okay? And when we're talking about animal viruses, there's two different flavors of capsids that we see, helical and icosahedral. Helical looks like a hollow tube, and icosahedral looks like a sphere, okay, or a round ball. So here we have an example of a helical capsid. It is made up of individual capsomeres, which are these little pill-like things. And these will stick together in a long chain, side to side, and then they kind of wrap around themselves, forming a helical structure. Okay? This creates a hollow tube where the DNA can actually go and rest and kind of hide out. Okay? Now, in a naked helical virus, this is what it looks like. It literally just looks like a hollow tube. However, they can also be enveloped, and when they're enveloped, the helical capsid curls around itself, forming kind of like a knot, and then the capsid and the envelope, uh, or excuse me, the envelope itself will then form around the virus. Icosahedral capsids, these are spherical in nature, okay? Their capsomeres are often triangular or square or pentagon in shape. And these, when they come together, form a hollow sphere. Okay? Inside of the hollow sphere, you will find the nucleic acid, which then makes up the so really, it just depends on the virus and what shape it wants to make, okay? It determines the type of capsid. Now, a lot of people ask me, how does the capsid get made? Well, it's relatively simple. These capsomeres are designed in such a way that when there's enough of them around, they just automatically assemble into this structure. They're kind of like magnets. They just stick to each other and form that hollow sphere or the hollow sphere. And again, these can also be enveloped. So down here we have an example of a herpes virus. You can see the core here in orange, the capsid here in blue, and then you see the envelope, which is this big floppy green thing covering. Now bacteriophages have a relatively different type of capsule. We call this, or capsid, we call this a complex capsid. And this is basically an amalgamation of both a icosahedral and a helical capsid, all right? This is designed in this way for bacteriophages, again, because they need to inject their DNA instead of fully entering the bacterial cell. So the way that this works is it has these hollow tube-like tails, which we call tail fibers. These will attach to the side of the, the bacteria, and then they'll pierce the cell wall using these tail pins, and then just inject their DNA into the bacteria. So they work very similar to All right, so that's enough about the capsid. Now let's talk about the envelope. So the envelope, again, is expendable. It's not found in all viruses. And if, in, in, if it is found on a virus, we call that an envelope virus. As I mentioned before, the envelope comes from the cell that the virus is leaving from. So once the virus is made, it needs to leave a cell. When it does that, it pushes itself out, and it will cover or encapsulate itself with cell membranes. This creates the envelope and then the virus will put spikes in the envelope so that it can then be used to infect other cells later on. So again, this is an example of a herpes virus. You can see the core, the DNA core here in green, the capsid here in orange, and then they have this big floppy envelope completely covering the virus. And in the case of HSV, the envelope is very, very large, and much larger than the virus itself. But again, this is taken from the cell that the virus is leaving 
So why have both the viral capsid and or envelope? Okay? The benefit of having the capsid and envelope, first and foremost, is it protects. Okay? It's going to protect the vital nucleic acid. Nucleic acid, by nature, is sensitive. Okay? It can easily be broken apart. So the virus protects it with this capsid and envelope so that that doesn't happen. Also, it helps the virus get that DNA or RNA into the cell, especially when we're talking about animal viruses. The uh, capsid and envelope is what physically pushes the virus into the cell, and when that happens, it then can uh, be dissolved, and then the nucleic acid can be released into the cell, infecting the cell with that virus. And then lastly, from our perspective, the capsid and envelope is pretty important because it helps stimulate the immune response. Okay? So when our body sees the virus, it sees the capsid and the envelope, and that's what our immune system will design antibodies towards, and that will help us clear the infection and hopefully prevent it from occurring again. Alright, so enough of the envelope, let's go into the nitty-gritty, and that is the core. Okay? As I mentioned, the core itself is made up of primarily nucleic acid. And all of the nucleic acid within a virus is known as a genome. Okay? So the genome is just all of the DNA or RNA. This is true for all organisms, not just for viruses. So if I were to look at all the DNA within my cell, I would call that the genome. Okay? Same with the virus. All the DNA or RNA within that, that virus is considered the genome. As I mentioned before, it can be either DNA or RNA, but it's never both at the same time. And the number of viral genes is really, really, really small. Okay? Uh, humans have about 25,000 genes, okay? which means we can make 25,000 different things in our cells. HIV, which is a pretty potent virus, has a total of nine genes. Okay? Very, very small amount compared to a human cell. But that doesn't mean it's you know, pointless, right? It gets into a cell, it can use those nine genes to take that cell over and then kill the cell. And when that happens over and over and over again, you can develop things like AIDS. And these, so even though there's a small number of genes, the genes that are there are extremely important, and they work very, very effectively. Okay? So even with just nine genes, a virus can get in, completely take over a cell that has way more genes and is way more complex than that virus is. Okay? And that's how efficient And it's important to note that they don't always follow the typical DNA and RNA formations. So when we think of DNA, we often think of it being double-stranded. When we think of RNA, we often think of it being single-stranded. Well, viruses don't care. Okay? You can have single-stranded DNA viruses and double-stranded RNA viruses. It just depends on how that virus works. So let's talk about some examples of animal viruses that can infect humans. Your book breaks these up based on whether they're DNA or RNA, and then whether or not they have envelopes or they don't, okay, or they're naked. So we'll start off with DNA viruses, and there's much fewer DNA viruses than there are RNA viruses. And the main reason for that is, is that to be a DNA virus, it takes longer to go through your life cycle. And the reason for that is, is the name of the game for viruses is to make protein. To make protein from your viral uh, nucleic acid, if you're a DNA virus, you have to go from DNA transcribe that into RNA, and then translate that into protein. Okay, so there's three steps. If you're an RNA virus, you can eliminate one of those steps, because you can go right from RNA into protein. So it becomes much, much quicker to be an RNA virus. So generally speaking, DNA viruses are slower. Okay? However, there's a huge benefit to being a DNA virus, and that is the fact that you have DNA. You can take that DNA and you can actually stick it into the nucleus of the cell that you're infecting, and now that cell is infected for the rest of that cell's life. So it takes longer, but you often get long-term or long-lived infections. Okay? So let's go through some examples. So we'll start over here on the envelope side of things, and then here we have pox viruses and herpes. Pox viruses used to be a pretty important human pathogen, and that's because of smallpox. Uh, smallpox was a very debilitating disease. It killed about 50% of people that got it. It would cause very nasty kind of rashes to form, which in some cases would open up ooze and mucus. 
The good news is, is it's the only human pathogen that has ever been eradicated, which means it's no longer in the human population. So as a whole, these guys aren't as scary because we have eradicated the, the most scary one. Herpes viruses, on the other hand, are very important human pathogens. There are many herpes viruses that can infect humans. HSV1 and HSV2 cause um, oral or genital sores, which I'm sure most of you are familiar with. Um, but there are other ones, so VBV, varicella zoster virus, causes chicken pox and shingles. Uh, CMV, cytomegalovirus, infects about 90% of us. Doesn't really do anything until we get older, and then it can cause organ failure. Epstein-Barr virus causes mono in some people. Other people, it does nothing. Okay? So these are very prolific human pathogens. And what's really interesting about herpes viruses is because they are DNA viruses, once you get infected with this, you have it for the rest of your life. So once you get herpes, like HSV1, you have it forever, right? And you may get outbreaks of it over and over and over again throughout your life. And again, it's because of the fact that they have it in their genome. Over on the non-envelope side of things, you have adenoviruses. This is a very diverse group of viruses. Most of these are going to cause mild, cold-like infections in humans. But you can also get some diarrheal-like diseases from adenoviruses as well. Papaviruses, these are, uh, this is where you find HPV, or human papillomavirus. This causes benign skin growth, so what we often call warts. But in some cases, it can cause cervical you know, you know, cancer. Okay? Just depends on the type of and then parvoviruses, uh, this isn't really a, an important human pathogen, um, but there are uh, some important uh, canine pathogens in this group. Um, first and foremost being canine parvovirus, which is a very deadly virus in dogs. It's very easily transmissible and can result in a quick death. All right, so those are the DNA viruses. What about the RNA viruses? So the beauty of being an RNA virus is that it's very quick, right? You're going in with RNA, and that RNA can almost immediately be translated into protein. That protein then assembles, and you get new viruses. So it's very, very fast. But the drawback to that is that you often create a short-lived infection. Because RNA isn't stable, it can easily be broken up by the cell, and so it doesn't stay in that cell for very, very long periods of time. There is one notable exception to that, and that are, uh, there's a uh, uh, retroviruses, where you find HIV. These are RNA viruses, but they do stay stably inside of the cell for very long periods of time. Okay? And we'll talk a little bit later about how that happens uh, in a bit. Now, when we break up RNA viruses into groups, we usually break them up based on whether they're positive sense or negative sense. Positive sense RNA viruses mean that their RNA, as soon as it gets into the cell, can immediately be translated into protein. So RNA gets in, Negative sense RNA viruses, the RNA is in the wrong orientation, so it has to be converted first into positive sense and then turned into protein. So there's an additional step, so these guys tend to take a little bit longer to get things done. And also sometimes with RNA viruses, you can see segmented genomes, which means it's broken up into chunks. And this will become important when we talk about influenza later on, because it So here are some RNA viruses that we find in eukaryotes. So over here on the segmented genome side, orthomyxoviruses, this is where you find influenza. Okay, influenza is a very prolific pathogen, not only in humans, but really any animal that has lungs. It originated in birds, but now it's spread all over the place, and it causes a respiratory illness. If you're really young or really old, this can be life-threatening, so it's still a very important killer uh, around the world. Next, we have paramyxoviruses. This is where you find measles. Okay? Measles is a very important human pathogen because it's the most infectious agent that we know of. Okay? It's extremely, extremely transmissible. It causes a relatively minor rash flu-like illness, except when you're really young, so under the age of, let's say, three months. Then it can be life-threatening. Okay? And so this is why it's important that we have the measles vaccine because it prevents the spread of this highly transmissible agent, especially in the most vulnerable, being really young children. I have a question. Why do they don't give you a measles 
Well, so when you're first born, you don't really have much of an of a, a immune response yet. So if we, I was to chock you full of all these vaccines, it's not necessarily going to start to work yet because your immune system just isn't ready. So what we do instead is we vaccinate everyone else, so all the adults, so that they don't get measles. And so that means if they go up to a child, they're not going to transmit the measles to that child who hasn't been vaccinated yet. And that's why vaccinations are very important. Okay? It's a concept called herd immunity, and we'll talk all about it uh, later on in Chapter so, below that we have rabido viruses. This is where you find rabies. This is a uh, mammal only uh, illness. It's transmitted through contaminated saliva and bites, the, the blood contaminated saliva. And it's one of the more cooler viruses because it actually works its way into the central nervous system and can actually change your behaviors to make you a more infectious agent. Velo viruses, this is where you find Ebola. As we all know, Ebola is a very deadly pathogen. It can kill about 50 to 80% of people that get infected with it, depending on the strain. And it causes hemorrhage. Okay? So you basically start to bleed out of every orifice. Coronaviruses, there aren't many human pathogens here, except for one, and that is SARS. So SARS is an acute respiratory illness that can be life-threatening. It came from civet cats, or a small little raccoon-looking thing in uh, Asia. Um, but that's the only guy in this group. So hopefully you're noticing that even though they're short-lived infections, it doesn't make them less severe. In fact, these are often more severe because they go so fast. And they just tear things apart as they go. Up over here by himself is the retroviruses. And this is where we find HIV, which is the most important retrovirus in humans. Retroviruses are unique because they contain an enzyme called reverse transcriptase. And this enzyme can convert the RNA genome into DNA once it gets into the cell. What this means is now instead of it being a short-lived infection, it results in a long-term infection that can stay with that cell for the rest of its life. Okay? And this is why HIV, once you get infected with it, you have it forever. Um, there's no cure for it. Yeah. Over here on this side, the non-enveloped viruses, the coronavirus, this is where you find uh, polio. Um, polio used to be a pretty common infection. It's transmitted through fecal oral route contamination. Most people who get it have no symptoms or develop no problems at all, but about 1% of people develop paralysis. Okay? And when you're talking about everyone in the population getting infected, 1% becomes a pretty big number. Calciviruses, this is where you find Norwalk-like viruses. Uh, this is a virus that was discovered in Norwalk, Ohio. It's only about an hour change from here. And this is a virus that causes pretty nasty gastrointestinal problems, so diarrhea and vomiting. These are the viruses that are most often associated with a cruise ship uh, foodborne outbreaks. Okay. When you hear of well, you know, Carnival Cruise, everyone's throwing up poop in the bag, it's because of this guy. And then real viruses. Real viruses is where you find rotavirus, another gastrointestinal type virus. However, this guy doesn't really do much to uh, adults because we develop immunity to it fairly early on. Okay? So it's usually only seen in young children. So those are the RNA viruses. Now, as we mentioned before, the viral genomes can be DNA or RNA, never both, and they can come in many different flavors, right? Single-stranded RNA, double-stranded RNA, single-stranded DNA, double-stranded DNA. Okay? It just depends on the virus. Now, viruses can also bring with them other stuff, okay? It doesn't just need to be DNA or RNA. It can bring with them what we call enzymes, and these are proteins that act as catalysts. We'll talk more about enzymes in Chapter 8, but just know that they do very specific functions, okay? One important uh, viral enzyme is reverse transcriptase. This is the viral enzyme that is brought with HIV, and this allows HIV to turn its RNA into so having these enzymes can be very, very important for the viral life cycle. Okay, so how do we classify viruses? How do we group them based on similarity? Okay. So earlier we talked about this with bacteria, and I said it's pretty difficult with bacteria because when you look under the microscope, they all look the same, right? So we can't say this guy looks like this and this guy looks like that, so they're you know, very close to the label. It becomes even more difficult with viruses. Not only do they oftentimes look the same, 
They are so small that we can't see them easily. Okay? So it becomes very difficult to classify them based on uh, phylogenetics or the way that they look. So instead, we often classify them based on their DNA or RNA. Okay? We'll take their DNA or RNA out, we'll sequence it or determine what type of DNA content they have, and then we'll compare that to all the viruses that we know of. It's 99.9% .9 the same to this virus, that means they're related. Now, when we classify viruses, we usually group them based on family and genera, okay, or the genus. And we never really go down to the species level. And the reason for that is there's a lot of variation with viruses. So if you were to go down to the species level, we would have millions upon millions of different species. And that just gets really confusing. Okay? So instead, we just stick down to the genera. When you hear someone say this is uh, hepatitis B virus or HIV virus, they're describing the genera. Anytime you see virus at the end, it tells you before that that is the genera for that particular uh, organism. And if you see anything with virde at the end, that denotes the family. Okay? So orthomyxoviridae tells you that is the orthomyxo family, and the influenza virus is the genus within that family. All right, so now let's talk about what viruses actually do, okay? What do they do? How do they get in the cell? How do they kill the cell and all these other things, okay? So uh, with viruses, uh, they all have what we call a viral life cycle. And this is how they get into the cell, take over that cell, and use that cell to make more virus. As I mentioned before, each virus does this in its own way, okay? And when you really try to nitpick it, it gets very complicated and very different from one virus to the next. But for our purposes, we can generalize it a lot, and we can say that all viruses really have only six parts to their viral life cycle. Okay? And those six parts are listed here. The first part is what we call absorption, and this is where the virus binds to the cell of interest. The next step is penetration, and this is where the virus enters the cell. Uncoding is where the virus then releases its nucleic acid into the cell. Synthesis is where this released nucleic acid can then be, uh, in this case, reverse transcribed or copied or translated into viral bits and pieces. So viral parts are made. These then assemble, and as I mentioned before, they just automatically stick together into viral particles. And then lastly, these viral particles are released. Okay? Once they're released from the cell, they can go off and then infect another cell and continue. Absorption, penetration, uncoding, synthesis, assembly, and release. These are the six steps that pretty much all viruses follow. Okay? So a little bit more detail about each of these steps. So first off is absorption. This is where the virus sticks to the cell it is interested in. Okay? On the surface of the virus, you have proteins, which are called spikes. And these spikes will bind to the cell that the virus wants to infect. So let's say we're talking about HIV. HIV targets CD4 cells, so cells that express a protein called CD4. How does HIV pick these cells? Well, its protein spikes only stick to CD4. So if a cell has CD4, virus sticks. Doesn't have CD4, bounces off. Okay? So this determines what we call the host range. Basically, it determines what type of cell the virus can infect. For the case of HIV, it's very narrow. Sees with cells with CD4, CCR5, or CXCR4. Okay? For the case of some other viruses, like VSV, for example, it can be any mammal cell. Doesn't matter. Any mammal cell it sees, boom, gets it. So it really just depends on the virus and how specific it wants to be. Once it absorbs or sticks to the cell of interest, it then needs to get in. And that's what penetration is. Interestingly enough, for animals or animal cells, most of the time penetration is brought on by the cell itself. So when something sticks to a cell and the cell doesn't like that, the first thing the cell does is it gobbles it up. It gobbles it up so it can break it apart and get rid of it. But in the case of a virus, instead of just breaking apart and getting rid of it, it's instead infecting itself with the virus. So the virus actually hijacks the cell's normal processes 
machinery to take over the cell. This process where the cell takes up stuff from the outside is known as endocytosis. The virus sticks, the cell literally engulfs it, swallows it up, and brings it into the cell. Uncoating, this is where the nucleic acid is released. Okay? So remember the virus has that uh, hard shell around it, the capsid, you know, protein. So for the virus to continue on its life cycle, it needs to get rid of that. How does it get rid of that? Again, the cell does it for it. So when a cell takes something in, it will dump nasty things on top of it, acid, reactive oxygen species, enzymes, to break it apart. In the case of a virus, it does the same thing, but instead of breaking it apart and killing it, it's just releasing the nucleic acid so it can go off and infect the rest of the cell. Okay. Synthesis, this is where all the bits and pieces for the virus are produced. If you are a DNA virus, this happens within the nucleus. If you are an RNA virus, this happens within the cytoplasm. Why? Well, DNA, all the bits and pieces for DNA are in the nucleus, so that's where it needs to happen. RNA is found in the cytoplasm, so all the bits and pieces in the cell for the RNA is found in the cytoplasm, so it works out well that way. So here we have two examples, an RNA virus and a DNA virus. This is HIV over here on the left. And you can see that everything is happening within the cytoplasm. On uh, the right, we have D a DNA virus. This is a herpes virus. And you can see that once the DNA gets into the cell, it then needs to migrate to the nucleus, where it can be replicated, synthesized into new viral particles, which then can release, uh, be released from the cell. And then the last two steps are assembly and release. Assembly is where all the bits and pieces come together to form new viral particles, what we call nascent bacteria. Again, this happens autonomously. So these proteins and nucleic acids are designed in such a way that if there's enough of them around, they just snap together, kind of like magic. Once that happens, they then need to be released. And this is where they are released from the cell into the environment. If they're not released, they can't go off and infect other cells. So this is very important for the virus to continue on infecting. Now, if they are in a non-enveloped virus, the way that they're released is they lyse the cell. So they cause the cell to rupture and all the viruses leave at once. If you are an enveloped virus, you instead are released through a process called budding or exocytosis. And this is where instead of all the viruses being released at once, one by one, the viruses are pushed out of the cell. Why does it do it this way? Because remember, with an envelope virus, it needs to cover itself with cell membrane. If it lysed the cell all at once, it couldn't do that. So instead, it just pushes one virus out at a time, and as it goes, it covers itself with membrane. This whole process, from start to finish, so from absorption to release, takes anywhere from 8 to 36 hours. RNA viruses are usually over here on the 8 hour side. DNA viruses are usually over here on the 36, 24, 36 hour side. So here's an example of a release of an envelope virus. You have the new virion hanging out real close to the cell membrane. It then literally pushes itself out of the membrane. And as it does that, it covers itself with it. This creates the bio envelope. And this is what it looks like in real life. So you can see these little uh, new virions, and they're literally pushing themselves out, covering themselves with them. All right, so that's what happens to each cell internally. Now what happens to the cell externally? So what can we actually see uh, happen? Well, when anything happens to a cell due to a viral infection, we often call this a cytopathic cyto for cell, pathic, like pathology or abnormality for cell. And this occurs in a couple different ways. So the first type of cytopathic effect is something called an inclusion virus. And this is a big kind of hole that forms in the cell, and it's just chock full of all these viral bits and pieces. And you can see it pretty easily under the microscope. Synesthesia, this is where you have multiple, multiple virally infected cells that fuse together. And this forms a giant multinucleated cell, which is abnormal. 
Latent infections, this is when a virus infects the cell, but then doesn't make viral stuff yet. So it infects the cell and then it just hangs out in the cell like nothing's changed. Okay? When this happens, the cell looks completely normal, looks completely healthy. But it's still virally infected. And then 5, 10, 20, 30 years later, the virus just decides to wake back up and starts to make virus and then kills the cell. Okay? And then lastly, transformation. This is where you actually change the cell. Okay? You don't necessarily kill it, you just change it. One example would be an oncogenic virus like HPV. Gets in, infects the cell, takes it over, makes more virus, and in the process turns it into an uncontrollable grower or a So here are some examples of cytopathic effects. Over here we have synesthesia, and you can see these big, giant, multinucleated cells. So the pink is the cell itself, and the purple are the nuclei. Cells should only have one, maybe two nuclei if they're divided. If they have eight nuclei like this guy, there's something wrong, okay? And it's probably got a virus. Over here we have inclusion bodies. So here's the cell, and you see these big green kind of pockets? That is the inclusion. Literally chock full of viral bits and pieces. Now, what is this usually resulting when we're talking about a whole bunch of cells, maybe in a tissue or within an organism? Okay. When you have a, a cell that gets infected with the virus, the most often outcome is death. And when you have a lot of t uh, cells in a tissue, you can lose a lot of tissue. Okay. This is by far the most common outcome for a viral. Some viruses, like papillomaviruses, are going to allow for proliferation. And again, this can result in cancer if it goes uncontrolled. Fusion, so this is where you form synesthesia. When this happens in places like the lungs, it can cause respiratory synesthesial uh, infections, which can be very nasty and cause kind of a, a, um, a raspy-like cough. And that's because the cells in the lungs are literally fusing Transformation, so this is where you can actually change the cell from one type to another. When we're talking about higher order organisms like ourselves, that can cause some problems. Um, so you can change cells and tissues from one type to another, and that can deform the tissue. This can happen with some adenoviruses. And then the weirdo in the group is rubella. And rubella is a weirdo because it does absolutely nothing to the cell. It doesn't change it, doesn't kill it, nothing. But virus is still produced. You still can develop disease from rubella because when the virus is released, your immune system sees it, it responds, and then you get sick. Okay? But it doesn't kill your cells. So here are just some examples of cytopathic effects with different types of viruses. Um, one of the most notable is measles. This is a, a virus that causes synesthesia. So you can easily tell if a cell is infected with measles because it becomes a giant mold. Now, uh, everything we've talked about so far has been uh, animal viruses, okay? These are viruses that literally push themselves into the animal cell and then take over that cell. Now let's talk a little bit about viruses that infect bacteria. These are called bacteriophages. Most of them have double-stranded DNA as their genome. And as I mentioned before, they do not fully enter the cell. Instead, they just attach and inject there are literally billions of different types of bacteriophages, most of which we have no idea about. Okay? But the ones we do know about, because there's so many of them, instead of giving them names, we usually give them a letter and a number. Okay? And you may ask, why do we give a shit about bacteriophages? Right? They're targeting bacteria, who cares? They're not farming us. Well, interestingly enough, bacteriophages can actually infect bacteria and when they do that, they can make them more pathogenic to humans. So it can cause an indirect infection. So you could have a bacteria that's harmless, gets infected with a bacteriophage, bing, bang, boom, now that bacteria is causing disease. So here is an example of a bacteriophage. As we mentioned before, it has a complex capsid, which is both icosahedral and helical. It does not actually fully enter the cell because of the thick cell wall. So instead it just attaches, injects a tube, which then they can uh, shoot it in 
Bacteriophages are released um, by rupture. Okay? They do not have envelopes. So by definition, they are all naked. And the way that it works is enough of these guys are produced in the bacteria that there's enough pressure that the bacteria just pops and releases the bacteria. So here you can see the remnants of a childhood E. coli organism and then all of these phages that have come out. Now, there are cases, though, where a bacteriophage will infect the cell, but then not actually make virus right away. This is a process called lysogeny. This is where a virus infects a cell and then it just sits there, it does nothing. This is what we call a silent infection or when we talk about animal viruses, we call this a latent infection. And you may ask, why would a bacteriophage want to do this? Well, it does this because it's a way of replicating. So let's say I'm a bacteriophage I inject my DNA into a cell, and then instead of having that immediately make virus, I just leave that DNA inside of the bacteria. Now, every single time that that bacteria divides, it's also going to copy the viral DNA. And so every single new bacterial cell that is produced is also going to be virally infected. And one day later on, some other point in time, those viruses can wake up, and now all of those cells that came from that initial cell will start making virus. So instead of having just one cell making virus right away, you now can have thousands upon millions of bacteria making viruses. So it's a way for the virus to replicate very, very, very quickly. Now, again, you may say, who gives a shit? Well, uh, this becomes important for us as well because sometimes weirdness can occur when this happens. And this is a process called lysogenic conversion. And this is where whenever the bacteriophage decides to make new virus, instead of putting in viral DNA into those new viruses, they instead put bacterial DNA. And so now when that virus leaves the cell and then goes to another bacteria and infects it, it injects bacterial DNA. And if that bacterial DNA codes for a toxin or antibiotic resistance or an enzyme, it now just made that bacteria pathogen. So this is how pathogenicity can be transferred to bacteria from viruses, okay? through this lysogenic conversion or the weirdness of lysogeny. So this is an example of a bacteria, a bacteriophage life cycle. So in a normal lytic bacteriophage, which means they get in and immediately make virus and then the virus releases, it looks like this, a circle. So you have absorption, where it binds to the cell of interest, just like we saw in animal viruses. Penetration, but instead of fully entering, it's just injecting nucleic acid. It then synthesizes all the bits and pieces. Okay? These then assemble into viral particles, which then mature, and then eventually lice and re are released from the bacteria. However, there are some bacteriophages which don't do this right away. Instead, they become lysogenic which means they inject their DNA, but that DNA doesn't do anything. It just incorporates into the bacterial chromosome and hangs out with that bacteria for a long period of time. So now every single time that this cell divides, it's going to be infected with the virus and could potentially make viral particles later on. This is a nice little table describing the differences between bacteriophages and animal viruses. The two biggest differences is penetration, which we've talked about before. Bacteriophages, only the DNA gets in. Animal viruses, the whole thing gets in. Okay? The other really big difference is viral persistence. Or how does the virus stay in the cell for long periods of time? With bacteriophages, this is called lysogeny, which we just talked about. In animal viruses, this is called latency. So how do we actually use viruses in the lab? Okay? To use virus in the lab, we have to have a lot of it. Okay? And so that usually means we have to grow it up. To grow virus, we have to have cells that the virus can infect. Because remember, viruses need cells to replicate. So you need to be able to grow the cells that the virus can infect before you can even think about working with viruses. To do that, we often use cell culture. 
And that is literally where we take cells, place them in a petri dish, dump in virus, virus affects the cell, replicates, out comes more, and then we can collect the virus. However, there are some weird viruses out there that cannot replicate in uh, artificial conditions. So instead, we need to use live animals. Okay? Where does this happen a lot where we use live animals? In the production of influenza. Influenza is one of those finicky viruses where it needs to be in a living organism. So what organism do we use? Chicken embryos. Why chicken embryos? Well, chicken embryos, uh, or birds in general, are the natural um, uh, reservoir for flu. Okay? So it's a logical place to go because that's where flu actually came from, birds. Also, chicken embryos are expensive and they're easy to keep, right? They're little eggs, so you can just keep them in a big kind of rack and container. So the way that we do this is we take a fertilized chicken embryo, we inject in a bunch of virus, we then let it incubate for a couple days, the virus grows uncontrollably in the embryo, killing the embryo, but then we make a lot of virus in the process. We then crack these open, purify out the virus, and then we can make things like the influenza vaccine. So there's an ever a shortage of the influenza vaccine is because we could not get enough of these fertilized chicken embryos for whatever reason. Most viruses, though, aren't that finicky. And okay? most viruses we can grow in what we call cell or tissue cultures. This is where we take cells, we grow them in artificial conditions, we can then infect them, they, the virus then replicates inside and then Viral, um, particles. HIV, for example, can be grown in tissue culture. So in our lab, we use human embryonic kidney cells. We squirt them on a plate. They grow into a thin <coughs> layer called a monolayer. It looks kind of like a thin piece of uh, tissue, thin tissue. And then we dump some virus on top. It infects those cells, replicates them, pops out. We then collect the media, purify out the virus, and now we have HIV. The cells that we use for this are often uh, what we call uh, immortalized, which means they grow indefinitely. Okay? Uh, the first type of cell used for this were cells called Hewla cells. Um, this stands for the person they came from, Hendera Lack. He was an African American in the 50s who had cervical cancer. They isolated these cells from her without her permission. Uh, and then they grew them, and they grew uncontrollably. Because by definition, that's what to this day, we still use HeLa cells from the original person. Okay? And we just keep growing them. All you gotta do is keep giving them nutrients, and they grow. More nutrients, and they grow. Okay? How do we detect viruses? So as we said before, viruses are really, really, really small. Okay? And yes, you can use an electron microscope to see them, but to do that, you need a lot of virus. So how do we detect when there's just a little bit of virus present? The answer is it's indirect, okay? And we do that using something called a flat assay. This is where, if we're dealing with animal cells, or excuse me, animal viruses, we use animal cells, or bacterial viruses, we'll, or bacteriophages, we'll use bacterial cells. And the name of the game here is you have to have cells that the virus can infect. We take these cells and we grow them in what we call a monolayer, and that's where the cells are growing like this. They're very close together and they form a dense layer on the bottom of the you then take the liquid that you suspect that has the virus in it, and you squirt it on top of these cells. If there's virus present, the virus will attach to a cell, it will infect that cell, replicate, and release more virus. In the process, it dies. That new virus then gets spread to the neighboring cells, infecting them, replicating, and then the cell dies. So over about a 24 to 48 hour period, but you end up with a big ass hole that form in the middle of this monolayer. This is where the virus has replicated multiple life cycles, killing all of the cells in the area. So all you gotta do is come back and you count how many of these holes you see, and you say, okay, each one of those holes equals one virus, so I have this many viruses. For bacteria, same thing applies. But instead of having a monolayer, you have what we call a lawn. This is where you take bacteria, really concentrated, spread it out over the auger so it's just one thick colony, one big thick layer. 
and then you add your liquid on top that has the virus. The virus lands in the bacteria, replicates, creating a hole, and then you count all the holes and it tells you how many viruses you have. So why do we care about viruses? Well, first and foremost, they cause disease, right? So as we mentioned before, viruses cause a lot of human disease. Influenza, all the hepatitis, HIV, all the colds, I mean, the list goes on and on, okay? Um, a lot of the most important pathogens, or, or a lot of the emerging pathogens, the new ones that have come up within the last 50 years, are viral in nature. Okay? So they are kind of the scariest ones, and also it doesn't help that you can't really treat them easily. Okay? There aren't that many compounds available to treat most viral infections. A lot of times you just have to let your immune system do the dirty work. Not only do they directly cause disease, but they also are associated with chronic so a lot of times we uh, used to think that some chronic diseases like type 1 diabetes, multiple sclerosis, um, were caused just purely genetic, right? So you just got shitty genetics and that's why you have type 1 diabetes. But what we're realizing is that it's a multifactorial thing, okay? It's not just your genetics, but it's also things like maybe you got infected with the virus very early on in life and that made you more uh, predisposed to getting type 1 diabetes. So there are some direct links between viruses that maybe don't cause disease, but could potentially cause problems later on. And then again, viruses can cause cancer. So HPV is a prime example. This is a virus that once it gets into the cell, causes the cell to grow uncontrollably, and this can form things like tumors. Now, not, um, uh, viruses aren't the only infectious agents or infectious particles around. There are other ones, so very, uh, our viroids, are plant viruses or pseudoviruses. And this is, uh, instead of being a virus where you have a capsid surrounding it, instead you just have literally RNA, that's it. The RNA then can wiggle through the cell wall, get into the cell, take it over, and then make more of that RNA killing the cell in the process. The other type of infectious agent is a prion. A prion is an infectious protein. So here we just have protein and no nucleic acid. These prionic proteins, they can get their way into cells. They then convert all of the protein in that cell to the prionic protein. This then sticks to itself, forming these big holes in the cell, eventually killing the cell. When this happens in um, the brain, we call this spongiform encephalopathy. An example of where this occurs is mad cow disease or Hudsfield Jacob disease. In this is where you ingest or produce the prionic protein because of genetics, and it works its way into neurons, slowly killing your neurons until you die. It's called spongiform because it creates little holes in your brain that looks like a sponge. The good news is, is this is relatively rare. We don't see that often in nature. Okay? However, it is transmissible in certain cases. So in the example with mad cow disease, I don't know how many of you guys remember this, but the 90s, there's a big hubbub about it, um, especially with Great Britain, because they found some cases of it in Great Britain. And the only way that you can pick this guy up is if you eat contaminated meat that's been contaminated by neurological tissue. Okay. It is important to note that prions are very stable, so you cannot break them up just by cooking. Okay. So uh, the key here is just to make sure that brain never comes into contact with the reason why it was a problem in Great Britain is because in Scotland they like something called haggis, and one of the main ingredients in it is, is uh, cow brain. Okay? So you can get around that nowadays 